Namaste. Sorry about all the problems. <laughs> it worked when I was trying it out, of course. But then when it comes time for the actual program, the software has problems. Ain't that always the way with computers? Tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to keep trying some different things to try to get this blankety blank software to work. It looks like the video is delayed, but maybe the sound is working. Let's see. The bit rate is all over the place, up and down, up and down. Okay, well, if the sound is basically working, then I guess we can go ahead and have some questions. Yeah, I think it's the local internet on Sunday night is just uh, not steady enough to support a good stream. So if the sound is working, go ahead and ask your questions, and I will respond. I guess I shouldn't type on this thing because it's going to make a lot of noise. I'm using the mic and camera from the computer itself. Okay, here's the question. What signs, oh boy. See, this is the problem. Self-realization is completely internal. So there are no definite signs. There's no, I mean, look at the scripture. You have some realized people who are like naked avadutas with no possessions. And then you have some who were kings. You have some who are sages in the heavenly planets and travel from place to place. And then you have some who live, you know, just in space. <laughs> as far as on the earth planet, you have some sages who are religious, uh, like have a, a position in a religious organization. And then you have some 
who are completely independent. Uh, the Oh, you should <laughs> watch the uh, Being in the World series. For an introduction to Heidegger, watch Being in the World. It's all about Heidegger's being and time. And then the next series after that is uh, Call of the Friend. Call of the Friend. It's all about Heidegger. Heidegger was where I started after I left the religious path. Are you all able to hear? Uh, it's just the connection is not steady. Yeah, well, Alan Watts, you know, I used to know people who knew Alan Watts because I used to live in the same part of California where he did, Marin County, Sausalito. I did a lot of gigs in Sausalito, jazz gigs and like that. And so I knew people who knew Alan Watts. And basically, you know, you know, he was, he was, uh, and I hate to say this, but <laughs> He was like screwing people at NBC, and that's how he got his television show. You know, he was a cute guy and, and a likable guy from everyone that I knew who knew him. But, you know, that's what you had to do in those days to get a show. And so that's what he did, and he got his show. But, you know, <laughs> He's not self-realized. He's not really a qualified guru. The poor guy was an alcoholic, you know, <clears throat> like so many of the gurus and teachers in that time and place, like Sufi Sam. Huh? Nobody knows who Sufi Sam is these days, but he was very popular Sufi guru, but he was an alcoholic. Nevertheless, he did serve to popularize some Eastern ideas and philosophy in the West. You know, so I guess he did some good service. I wonder where he is now. <laughs> Oh yeah, Heidegger, there's tremendous value in his philosophy because it gets you off the mental platform. Believe it or not, I mean, his stuff comes across as very highly intellectual, but that's just his language. He's using very philosophical language. But his ideas, if you can cut through the, the way he expresses them, 
to the ideas themselves are very practical, very down to earth. That's why I said watch being in the world. Being in the world is your fundamental introduction to Heidegger. And then the next part, you know, being, being that's the first part of the book, and time, the second part of the book, that's covered in Call of the Friend, which is another series that we did back in the days. Let's see, what's this? Well, yeah, you pretty much, you have to be realized yourself to distinguish between a very intelligent person or a very spiritual person and a realized person. You know, some realized people don't look anything like what's described in the scriptures, and some do. You know, it's really a problem because Unless you yourself are realized, you won't be able to tell. You can get cheated. And the way you're getting cheated is if you follow their instructions and it doesn't work. Oh boy, we really have a crappy connection here, I'm sorry. Better to do this in the morning. Well, if you can hear, I guess that's something, um, you know, I don't know what else to say. This problem of recognizing the real is very difficult. Because there are some people who, for example, follow all the rules given in the scriptures, but they're not realized. And then there are some people who don't follow any rules. <laughs> but they are realized. See, the, the inner condition of a person's consciousness is, is not at all, how can I say, necessarily reflected in their outer being. You know, there are a few things though, now that I think about it, that a realized person is mood. You know, they're not, attached to what happens. Well, sometimes they might act like they are, but uh, it's just unreliable, you know. Any external indicator is unreliable. What's this? Oh, Om Shamana. Look, I have posted many times this diagram of the four levels. Dvaita Vada, Vishishta Dvaita Vada, Vivarta Vada, and Ajata Vada. So, yeah, Ajata Vada is the top, and at that level there is no I, there is no world. There's no consciousness, only pure awareness. But you can't pretend to be on that level, and you certainly can't superimpose that level on any of the lower levels, because you just wind up with nonsense. Like, what did you say here? 
If there is no I, is there any experience? Well, if there's no I, who is writing the question? Who is writing the question? If there is really no I. wrong with that is that you're expressing things about the highest of a lower stage and it turns to, to gibberish. It's meaningless to say, well, if there is really no I, you know, but there is an I. That's who's writing the question. So I don't know what to say. I don't, I don't like to give my opinions on other teachers, especially if I don't know them personally. You know, but what I can say is that so-called Sadhguru is giving very low level teachings. He's not giving the Vishishta Dvaita or the uh, Vivarta level teachings. He's only giving dualistic teachings. So I guess he's trying to build a big organization. Now, I've seen this kind of thing before, like with Osho. Osho, when he became enlightened, or at least he reached, at least he reached first path, according to the descriptions in his books. He reached per first path realization. But then he started going all over India and building a big organization. And he did ultimately create a, a huge community. And of course, he got entangled in all kinds of problems and money and power and you know all the nonsense that goes on in big organizations so what can i say you know it's like personally i've been in big organizations and now that i'm satisfied i wouldn't go near any of them you know so it's kind of unfair for me because at a certain stage in spiritual life, they can be helpful. But you have to know when to walk away. You know? Know when to hold. Know when to walk away. Know when to run. <laughs> so that's, you know, playing the game of spiritual organizations and gurus is... You know, it's a two-edged sword. On one hand, if it's something that you need at the time, what is this? Uh, first path to second path. Let me see, I have to think back. Okay, first of all, all four path realizations are actual visions of Brahman or Nirvana, the Absolute. They're all genuine. It's just that until you get to fourth path, they're not permanent. They come and go. So someone with a first path realization gets a huge enlightenment experience. But then it goes away, it fades after a few weeks or a few months. And they don't really go back to the way they were before because now they've seen. And once you see, you can't unsee. So, 
this becomes like a seed that drives them further, right? Now, gee, you're making me think back because it's been so long since I went. See, I got first path in 1984. <laughs> it's like, what, 35 years ago? 36 years ago? And I remember first path very vividly. I didn't get second path, though, until about 30 years later when I was a Buddhist monk. And I started studying with Bhikkhu Nyanananda. And Bhikkhu Nyanananda taught me something with three words. <laughs> he said, Nirvana, Nibbana in Buddhist, in the Pali language, is non-conceptual. Three words hit me like a brick. And I immediately realized second path. You know, it, it, there's a really good Wikipedia article. Look it up. I think it's titled Four Stages of Enlightenment. Four Stages of Enlightenment. And that gives a very good description of the four path realizations. So, that's better than me trying to dredge my memory <laughs> and remember what all those were like because the last one was um, more than five years. Well, I can remember fourth path, very dramatic. I was on a plane. <laughs> I was on a flight from Oslo, Norway to Colombo and we had to make a stop in, uh, what was it? Not Abu Dhabi, but uh, that place with the big tall skyscraper, um, Dubai. We made a stop in Dubai. And I had been meditating really intensely the whole trip out from Norway. And as we began to descend into Dubai, there was a nice couple sitting right next to me with a small baby. And you know, sometimes when the pressure changes, the baby's ears can give them pain. So the baby started crying. And they were very apologetic. They were very nice. but. I just increased my concentration and all of a sudden, bang, I broke through. I got fourth path. And fourth path is the complete annihilation of the ego and the personality. So there I was in Dubai huh? at like midnight and like tripping like crazy on this fourth path shattered. And I'm in this huge airport, you know, in Dubai. So I, I really said, man, I really got to like sit down someplace quiet. <laughs> so they had a mosque in the airport because it's an Arab country, you know. They had a mosque. So I went to the mosque. And, you know, I just put some cloth on my head and washed my feet and went into the mosque and did namaz, you know, like you're supposed to do. And I just sat there going, oh, my God, you know, what is this? And somehow, you know, I got, got it together enough to catch my next flight and get on the plane to Colombo, Sri Lanka. <laughs> And when I got to Sri Lanka, when I got to my house, I had this really far out house, way out in the jungle. And uh, I was like, how the heck am I going to take care of myself if I let my whole, you know, mind and personality fall apart? How am I going to survive? because I had nobody at that time that I could trust 
I didn't have a supportive community. I wasn't in a monastery. I was just in a private house, a small house. So I had to, this is so weird, I had to deliberately create a false personality, a false ego, just in order to take care of my body, because otherwise I would have been like a baby. I would have been just completely helpless if I had completely gone into it. And then, and uh, you see, this is why there are monasteries. This is why there are communities of monks, because when somebody goes through this shattering experience, they need to be taken care of for a few days until they get it together, you know. But anyway, somehow or other, I got through it. <laughs> Let's see, what is people saying here? Well, Dave, this is normal because the majority of people are not even in human consciousness. They're in subhuman or animal consciousness, sense consciousness only. So when you start awakening and you start realizing what is the self, what is pure consciousness? You are going to become alienated. You're going to become different. You're going to become, yeah, like from another planet, a stranger in a strange land. Oh, speaking of path realizations, when I got first path, first path, I was in Portland, Oregon. I had just been living on Rancho Rajneesh with Osho and all his crazy devotees. And I had been like, he gave me this place way out in the desert all by myself. And I would just come in for meals. I wouldn't really mix with the other sannyasins. I felt that most of them were just, you know, there for the party, not really to work on themselves. So I didn't hang out with the other sannyasins. I stayed by myself. And then when I left, I came back to Portland and I was in my apartment. And I've told this story many times before. I was meditating like 10, 12, 16 hours a day. And I got first path. The goddess came and personally gave me Shaktipat. It was wild. And I was so blissed out. Ah, it's just nothing like it. And after a few hours of this, I said, well, I better, I better make sure that I haven't lost my mind. <laughs> Actually, I had lost my mind, but, you know, I wanted to make sure I wasn't crazy. So I said, I'll go down to the local tea shop and have a cup of tea. And I went down to this place and the people were dead. They were like cardboard cutouts. I mean, the, the house plants in the shop were more alive than the people. They were more authentic, more present than the people. And the people apparently could not perceive me no one would respond to me. It was so weird. It was like they were all asleep. So I decided to test it. I decided to really push, push the limits. I cut in front of the line. I poured myself a cup of tea, put milk and honey in it, and just walked out without paying. I've never done that before or since, by the way. It was an extraordinary situation and I wanted to test it. <coughs> <coughs> I 
Nobody said anything. I think I was at such a higher degree of consciousness that people just couldn't perceive me. They, they, I might have been there